All right, so we're in this series. We're talking about starting uh, with God, and we're talking about finances. We talked about finances last week, and we're talking about finances this week, and we got one more week next week. Keep talking about our finances. But last week, we discussed the heart of giving and what that means. Now, if you missed last week's uh, sermon, you can see it online. It's on the Facebook page. I may be on the website. I don't know if it's on the website yet. It's on the website. All that different stuff, right? It's all there. Liz does a great job with that. Um, but the heart last night that we talked about of giving comes from God, that we are designed, that we are made in God's image to be givers. And when we're not giving, we're not being who God designed us to be. And a lot of other things in our life starts falling apart. We start not functioning like God intended us for a to function if we aren't giving. What happens is being generous instead of being selfish is much easier on marriages and on relationships and in the workplace and all those things. We talked about that last week. All right, next week we're gonna be looking at something that James, which who was the brother of Jesus, had to say about finances. And he, what he has to say is something very direct, very bold and kind of harsh, but it's something that we all need to hear. We're gonna talk about it next week. Now this week, however, we're going to be very, very practical. So the beginning of, let me tell you what's gonna happen, the beginning few minutes, we're gonna be very practical and then we're gonna look at something very important that brings it all together that Jesus Jesus said that I think is so powerful this week. That's how we're going to end. So um, if you want, get out your pen and pencil. You might want to take some notes and stuff like that this week. Um, but along the way, what I want to do is make some points and I want to point out some stuff. It's going to be on the screen. You might want to write this down, but I'm going to keep it very, very, very simple this morning. So my very first point when it comes to your finances this morning is don't avoid the math. Okay, that sounds very simple and it's crazy to say this, but you actually have to sit down and with a calculator and figure out how much money you have versus how much money you can spend, all right? How much can you can afford? Now, I've seen a lot of couples who have been terrible at this, young couples that get married and what happens is they almost immediately overextend themselves. I've seen it, you've seen it, where young couples get married and the next thing you know, they have a house and you're all wondering, how in the world did they afford that house? And then the, they start driving new cars. You're like, what's going on? How in the world are they affording all these cars? And they can't. And so they get themselves in trouble because they bit off too much. Including in that is sometimes they're already upside down because of the honeymoon. They spent too much money on the honeymoon. We've seen that over and over and over. So here's some advice to you young couples or you're thinking to get married, okay? Listen very carefully. Um, Here's some of my advice for the honeymoon. You don't need a room in Paris, France, okay? You just need a room, so get one you can afford. That's what I'm saying. Don't avoid the math, right? I've seen uh, young couples who are already struggling go and buy houses and all these things, and then they just get themselves in trouble. And the reason is, is that their eyes and their needs and their wants avoided the math. They didn't sit down and say, can we afford this? Sit down, track just how much money you have, how much you bring home in a month. We're looking at in just a minute. And after you figure in taxes and tithes and all of that, then start budgeting something. That's what we're going to look at today. Now, I knew a guy when I was um, growing up and he was terrible at this. He rented from my dad. My dad had some rental property and this guy got a job at U.S. Air, and he'd never made this much money in his life, and so what he would do is he would get paid on Friday at U.S. Air and spend his entire paycheck on the way home from work. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but I watched this when I was a kid. He would come home with a boat. It was hilarious. And the next week, he'd come home with a motorcycle. Darren's laughing. It's so funny. It was like we thought he was the coolest guy in the neighborhood. He had all these toys, but then he didn't have any money left over to pay for food and his rent. It was, it was crazy. He forgot that he had to buy groceries and all that kind of stuff. Um, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. So then what would happen, the neighbors would call and they would tell my dad, you need to come down here again because this couple is out in the yard fighting again. They're running around the yard screaming and cussing, physically beating the fool out of each other. And it was always tied in with money. It happened all of the time. So I'm saying don't avoid the math. Use a calculator. They taught you that in high school, I think. I know couples who start buying uh, the car. Sometimes they'll start the car buying conversation on Friday morning. You know, I really need a car. I just can't stand this thing. We need to do this. And then Friday night, they own a new car. It's crazy. And there's no way they can afford this. And what they'll say is, well, we'll just figure it out. And I'm thinking, you're not going to figure it out because if you had figured it out, you'd have figured you can't afford this. So don't avoid the math. But number two is do avoid debt. This, this is important. Don't avoid the math, but avoid the debt. 
It's crazy, but here's the advice that you have to give people concerning money these days. You've heard this before. Don't spend money you don't have. That seems obvious, but it's important. Don't spend money you don't have. Don't get yourself in debt. Here are some statistics to show you how bad we are as Americans at this. More than 189 million Americans have credit cards. Okay, well, that's not that big a deal. You know, credit cards are useful. We use them in our family because you go to the gas pump, you know, you just want to put it in and not go inside. It's a little safer, all that kind of stuff. Just go, I get paid by the church once a month. And so what happens is we, you know, we put a gas and stuff on the credit card. And then at the end of the month, when the credit card bill comes in and then I get paid, everything goes out all in the same day. That's how it works. It's fine. The average credit card holder, however, these days, this is astonishing to me. The average credit card holder has at least four different credit cards though. Average of four, people have more than four credit cards? I mean, that's crazy. Why do we need all these credit cards? Well, this is, the, the statistics here are starting to worry me. Check this one out. On average, each household with a credit card uh, carries an average of $8,398 in credit card debt. An average of over $8,000 in credit card debt. What? Isn't that crazy? That's, I mean, people have more than eight, people have $8,000 in credit card debt and then some people have more than that. We're all in debt. Listen to this. The total U.S. consumer debt is at right now 13.68, I'm sorry, $13.86 trillion. America, that includes mortgages, auto loans, credit cards, and student loans. Right now, the consumer debt in America is, thir- is over $13 trillion. Get yourself out of debt. Well, what does the Bible have to say about all this? It has a lot to say about it. Listen to what Romans 13, 8 says. Owe no one anything except to love each other. If your financial advisor or someone is telling you that it's fine to be in debt and you should be in debt, don't listen to them. Listen to the Bible. Owe no one anything except to love one another. What he's saying is the only thing you owe God or someone else is friendship and love and care for someone else. That's what you owe them. Here's what Proverbs 22, seven says. The borrower is a slave to the lender. We know this is true. The borrower is a slave to the, we hate slavery. We talk about that. And he's saying you are a slave if you, own, if you owe someone something. And this is what Jesus says about slaves And masters, listen to Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and despise the other, or he will be devoted to the one. I'm sorry, he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and, and he doesn't say the devil. He says money. You can't serve God and money. He knows that we have a problem with this. Get yourself out of debt. Here's what he says, you will, we will serve a master. Someone is going to be master over you. That's not in question. This is Jesus' point. But if God is the master of, you, of your life and your finances, then you'll love him and be devoted to him. That's true. If, you, if he is the master of your life, because instead of you owing him, you know that he's paid the debt for you and you're free in him. And though that's why you will love and be devoted to him and you'll hate and despise money instead. But if money is the master, then you'll love and be devoted to the money and you'll end up hating and despising God. That's what happens. Get out of debt. Don't get into debt you can't repay. Don't be a slave to the lender. Don't avoid the math. Avoid the debt and don't let money be the master and end up hating and despising God because you've given your heart and soul to something else. That's what he's saying. All right, so my third point this morning is live off of half. Don't avoid the math, avoid the debt and live off of half. Now I'm gonna talk about this just for a minute, okay? Here's how it works. I'm gonna do some math and we're gonna keep it very simple. We're gonna use round numbers this morning. Now, let's just say, for instance, I'm gonna put this number on the screen. If you make $1,000, woo I like that. If you make $1,000, now some of you are thinking, I can't live off $1,000 a week. And some of you are thinking, I wish I had $1,000 a week. I mean, I know, but this is just for our, our adding purposes this morning, all right. <coughs> Excuse me. If you can make $1,000 a week, then figure in a budget that's pretty simple and healthy for you. First of all, I agree with the Bible. And the Bible says that we should start with God. That's what we're talking about. 
So if you start with God, then you would start with tithing 10%. We talked about this last week. Now, some people tithe 10% after their taxes. Um, I disagree because of worship. I'm explaining that to you. I used to say, it's fine if you tithe after taxes or whatever. I'm not saying that anymore. It's not fine if you tithe after taxes. And here's why. In the Old Testament, they were required to come and give God what they called the first fruits. Okay, here's what that meant. If you owned an apple orchard, let's just say, if you own an apple orchard, when you go out to pick apples off the orchard, what is the first apple you're gonna pick off the tree? The red one or the green one? (laughs) The red one, right? The red delicious tree is gonna have that nice, really pretty one. Well, as you start picking apples down through there, it's gonna get worse and worse and worse as you go. You're gonna start picking apples and putting them in there that's got a worm in them or whatever else. Well, I just, you know. So what God is saying, don't do that to me. It's my tree, I made it, I gave you the apples. Give me the first and the best. That's what he is saying. It's worship. When you come to worship God, give him your very best. Don't give him your second best. That's what he's saying. Um, You're going to pick, um, you, you need to pick the very best and give it to him. He asked us to bring his, our best in worship. For Teresa and I, this is the first fruits. And so we have always done this. We give and we tithe before taxes and expenses included, all of that kind of stuff. That's what we do. So if we take $1,000 and we subtract 10% from that, which is 10% of 1,000, got your calculators, pretty easy, it's $100. So if you make $1,000 a week, you tithe 10% right off the top, then you're left with $900, okay? Now, let me tell you a second thing. Taxes are a thing, you know this, all right? Um, You better get used to them, they're not gonna go away. They're not something new that we just invented. They've been around for a long, long time. Nobody loves taxes. We hate it, all right? But you have to pay it. Don't avoid taxes and don't cheat the government. Let me tell you why. Because Jesus says so. That's why. Um, They asked him one time if they had to pay taxes. There was a story about Jesus and them. They said, should we pay our taxes or whatever? And he said, let me see the coin. And they flipped him a coin and he looked at it and he turned it around and said, whose picture is on it? And they said, Caesar, and he said, well, then give Caesar what's his and give God what's his, which I thought was great because he's saying give the taxes, but the truth is, is the money is God's and even Caesar is God's, so you figure it out. Give 10% of your tithe, give what the government has asked for. All right, now for our figuring purposes, we're gonna take 30%. We're gonna say um, taxes take about 30%. That's about a third or whatever. Again, we're just, I realize that some people make, pay less, some people pay more, all that. It's just round numbers. That's what we're trying to use. So for our purposes, 30%. So 30% of $1,000 would be $300. Now, it would be great if the government took their taxes out after we tithed. (laughs) but they don't do that. Like 30% of 900 would be great, but they don't. So they take 30% of 1,000, which is $300. All right, now, if we take um, 10% now that we're looking at and we take out the 30%, the 600, here's what we have left, all right? Let's put this on the screen. So $100 for tithe, $300 for taxes out of our 100, then we have $600 left. All right, well, we're not, we're not done yet. There is something else that people skip that's very important. The majority of people don't do this, and that is called savings. You need to save money. An online website said that in 2019, this is last year, that almost 70% of Americans don't have $1,000 saved up anywhere. 70% of the Americans don't have $1,000 anywhere, and 45% of all Americans say they don't even have a dollar saved up, no savings at all. Why? Well, because I think we're so consumed with living for right now that we don't think about tomorrow. And it's why we're way over our head in debt, credit cards, cars, houses, education. And here's what happens. Most people will spend whatever they make. They'll spend all their money. It, so it really doesn't matter what you make, you'll still spend it all. That's what we do. Like if you make $500 a week, you'll spend $500 a week. If you make $5,000 a week, you'll spend $5,000 a week. I promise you that's what you'll do. Um, if, if, I have a friend who says that his monthly expenses for his house is $25,000. $25,000. 
I can't imagine spending $25,000 a month, but that's what it costs for his family of four to make it, to live. So what I'm saying to you, it doesn't matter what level you get to, everybody seems to spend all of their money. They fill it up. Um, and it's just, it's crazy. I can't imagine that. But here's the deal, what I've learned. If it costs an arm for something, most of us will throw in a leg. <laughs> and I'm saying, don't do that. If it costs an arm and a leg, save one of them, okay? Keep your arms and legs, all right? Let's save something, all right? We need to be saving. Here's why we need to be saving. We need to be saving for hard times. Stuff comes and goes. Things change all the time. Save for rainy days. Save for retirement. Here is a really big one to think about saving for. Save for ministry. Save for ministry. Teresa and I have always said we wanted to stay out of debt so that when God called us to do something, I didn't have to look at him and say, I can't do that because we've made poor choices we're upside down, we got a lot of debt, and I can't afford to do what it is that you're calling me to do. I'm never going to look at him and say that. That's not what I ought to do. So when we save money in case something happens, we can do what God wants us to do, go where he says go, and be who he wants us to be. That's what we've decided. <clears throat> about eight years ago, let me give you an example of how this worked out. About eight years ago, we were able to save more money in about six months period of time than we ever have. Just for our purposes, we were. It was just a job and life transitions and everything was going on. But we were able to start saving more money than we ever had in our life. But we knew better than to spend it because we knew that it was going to stop. The way I won't explain it all, but the money was going to stop coming in. So what we said was that I wonder if God's giving this to us for some reason. So we need to save it. So we continued to cut back. No, um, no fancy cell phones, um, no um, eating out, no car buying, no home phone, none of that kind of stuff. We were out of debt um, except for our house, which we've always tried to do. And um, God actually worked it out in this period of time that if we had actually left our house and moved into an apartment, it would have cost us even more money because our house payment was so low, he just worked us out. So it was great. So what we did was we just saved and we waited. God must be doing something. So we saved our money and we waited because we didn't know at the time that two years later after this that he would say, hey, I want you to go and start a church. I want you to go and start Mission City Church. And what we needed was all of that money that he had given us to live on. Interesting thing about it is that we almost spent every single dollar that we had in our savings to start this church. And I loved it, I loved it. Um, and just before we ran out of money, God showed up, he saved the day, and he really took care of us. But the early days were really tough, and a lot of, it took a lot of faith. And Teresa would look at the count, and she would look at us and me, and we would talk about it, and she'd say, how far are we going to go with this? And we both agreed until we give our very last dollar. Maybe he's asking us to give all of it away. And I'm going to explain that in just a minute, because I think that is what he's asking us to do. But he's asking, maybe he's going to just take all of it, um, and we're just going to keep giving it until it's all gone and then we'll quit because here's what I believe that we're not going to go into debt because when God calls he provides he does when he calls he provides and it doesn't say when I call and I'm gonna provide a whole lot of extra he's just going to provide and so we trusted him that he was going to provide for us so if you save money then we'll just say for our purposes we're going to say 10 percent actually you really should be saving 15 percent but um, we're gonna make it easy on us. So we're just gonna say 10%. So if we say $1,000 and we take 10%, we're back to our 10% again, it's $100, it's pretty easy. So here's how it all works out. If we give $1,000, let's go to the next screen. Um, we have $1,000 we start out with. We give 10% for tithe, we give 30% for taxes, and we give 10% for savings, then we end up with $500 left. And then that's half of what you make. That's how, that's how I come up with these figures. Now, if you can figure on living half of everything that you make, you're probably on your way to a pretty healthy life financially. You take the half that you have and go buy a house and a car and do whatever you want to with the money. I mean, if you, half of your money is an airplane, go buy an airplane. I mean, whatever you want to do with it, you can do with it if the math works. If you make $1,000 a week, that's roughly $4,000 a month. You take roughly half out for the, tithe, the tithe, taxes, and savings and all, and you're left with about $2,000 to spend each month and live off of. Now, 
Let me uh, end this little section like this. Dave Ramsey, if you don't know who he is, he's a financial advisor, a Christian guy, and he's got some great, great advice. You can find it all over the internet. But I wanna show you some stuff. And he says, let's take some baby steps in our finances. And here's some baby steps that Dave Ramsey gives us. I'm gonna go through these real fast. You can write them down, take a picture of it, whatever it is. But the first one is he says, just try to save up $1,000. First of all, just see if you can start saving and work toward the first baby step is save $1,000. The second one is pay off all of your debt. And he understands, he says, accept the house because that's, that's hard to do. Um, it takes a few years, half of a lifetime <laughs> to do that, but that's okay. But get out of debt. Number three, save about three to six months um, expenses for like an emergency fund <clears throat> if you lose your job or whatever else happens. Number four, Invest 15%, there's the savings piece of your household income for retirement. Number five, save for your children's college fund. If you don't have kids, you can skip that one, all right? But if you do, you might wanna start saving toward that. Number six, pay off your house early. So if you can save up enough money, start investing in some retirement, <clears throat> get your college fund going, then try to start paying off your house early. That's what he's saying. And then the last thing he says, man, just get rich and then give as much as you can away. Do whatever you want. Build wealth and just give. Be generous with your money. Now, I wanna end this way this morning. I think this is very, very powerful. There's a story that Jesus tells that I wanna share to bring all of this together. And this story is, is, is very, very, very powerful. Um, I can't get it out of my mind and my heart this week. But here's what he says <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Some of you have heard this before. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, <clears throat> which a man found and he covered it up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. Matthew 13, 44. Now, one thing that the Bible doesn't give us is this, the ability to hear Jesus say it, to hear the inflection in his voice, the passion and, and how he said it. I think that was what would have been so powerful about hearing him speak was what did it sound like? Where, what words did he kind of uh, make more of or whatever? And so I prayed this week and I asked, dear God, help me understand that. And so I feel like the Holy Spirit this week kind of spoke to me and said, here is the meaning. Here's what he wanted you to hear. Here's what he was trying to say in this one very powerful verse, what he has to say about the kingdom of God and about your finances. So when Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like, I'm all ears. <clears throat> I want to know, don't you? I want to know, what is the kingdom of heaven like? Do you remember this uh, Narnia? Ever, anybody ever seen the movie or read the book Chronicles of Narnia? And there's this scene in there where the old guy is talking to the kids and they're describing to him about Lucy, their sister who went in the wardrobe and found a whole nother world, a whole nother kingdom. And they're like, uh, she's crazy. They didn't think that she, it was true. And he leans in and he said, what was it like? And that's what I feel like when he says the kingdom is like, I'm like, well, what is it like? Tell me, I wanna know, I'm all ears. And that's how I feel when he says this, but don't in, misinterpret when he says the kingdom of heaven is like, because he's not talking about the kingdom of heaven like that's coming some other time. Well, the kingdom, uh, yeah, that heaven is after we die. This is not the kingdom that he's talking about here. He's talking about on earth as it is in heaven. Remember the prayer when he said that? He's talking about the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. And here's what he says. He said, it's like a treasure hidden in a field. Well, isn't that interesting? The kingdom of heaven is, uh, is a treasure hidden in a field. So you're telling me um, that the kingdom is hidden somewhere, like you have to go looking for it? Do you mean you have to go searching for the kingdom of heaven, looking for it? And then he says, which a man found, and he covered it up. So the kingdom of heaven is like this hidden treasure that you have to go looking for, but it can be found. And then the man, he finds it and he covers it up. And then it says this, then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. Now this is the part of the story that's really risky. Think about this. The man knows that this treasure that he has found is like nothing he's ever seen. It's amazing. This treasure that he stumbled on or he went looking for or whatever, he found it 
Maybe he heard about the treasure and he went looking because no one else has found it yet, but it's like nothing he's ever seen before. And then what he does is he hides it and he leaves it there and with great joy over what he has found, he, he leaves and goes away. Now think about when you have given your life to the Lord, the first time you came to Christ and you stumbled upon the treasure, you found it or whatever it was, and then there's this joy that's in you and you know that it's there and you feel this emotion of what God has done. He's just set you free. Can you imagine how excited he is? And, in, and he is in a hurry to get this treasure and you would be too. But here's the deal. There's all kinds of risk involved in this. There's a lot of risk in this treasure. Um, what if he goes off and he sells all of his stuff to go get the treasure and he comes back and the treasure's gone? What if he just missed it? What if he didn't get there in time? <clears throat> There's so many possibilities of him getting hurt in this. But in his hurry, he runs away and he sells all of his stuff. From the time he finds this treasure, he is excited and it says he is filled with joy and there is nothing going to stop him from getting this treasure. But the only way that he can get the treasure is to do what? Sell everything. The only way that he can get that treasure is he's got to get rid of everything he has in order to get that. But now here's the deal. He doesn't have to go and get the treasure, does he? He doesn't have to go at all. He can choose to talk about the treasure. He can tell all of his friends, I found this treasure. You should, and tell, for the rest of his life, he can tell a story about a treasure that he knows is in a field somewhere, but he's not willing to go do what it takes to get it. And he can brag about that treasure that's over there, but he won't go and get it, but he's not like that. He can keep his current property and his houses and everything that he's got, and he can keep living the way that he's living right now. Nothing has to change. He can continue to do that. It's too risky. There may be too many possibilities for disaster, but this guy, he is not like that. He's not that guy because it must be some kind of treasure. And it's so valuable to him that he is willing to risk everything financially and go and get this thing that he knows is immensely worth more than everything he has. Isn't that amazing? And Jesus said, and that is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Everything that you have is worth nothing compared to what this treasure it is. And the only way you get that treasure is get rid of all of your stuff and go and get that treasure. Isn't that amazing? He's saying, is it worth the risk to you? First off, you have to find the treasure. And if you haven't found that treasure, if you haven't come to Christ and surrendered your life, then I want you to come talk to me today. After the service, just come and find me. Um, if you think you know where that treasure is, I'm saying, then what in the world are you doing waiting? Go do what it takes to get that treasure. Jesus says, sell everything you have and go get it. Commit all of it, everything that you have, go and get it. Start with God. Take all of the money that you have, this is what I'm saying this morning, in your hands and hold it to God and say, here is what I have. This is all that I have, all my finances, all my money, all my stuff. Take it from me and give me that because it's worth so much more than what I have. And I know that. I want the treasure that you have. That's what Jesus is saying we're supposed to do with our money. Sacrifice it all. Give it all. Commit it all. Start with God. See, here's what we need. And this I'm in. We need a new vision. But we don't need a new vision for our finances. What we need is a new vision for the kingdom of God. That's what we need. Start with that treasure. Start with that field Start with God and give him all of it because what he's going to give you in return, you have no idea how much it's worth. Dear God, I